grace is found is where you Temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered mended like me Oh, I once was lost But now I am found Was blind But now I see Oh, I can see you now Oh, I can see the love in your Laying yourself down Raising up the broken to
What a wonderful message that we have to sing and praise God about. The amazing grace of God and his love that he's poured out for us and has forgiven us of so much. Uh, if, and uh, to, for us to be able to come and celebrate what God has done to provide a way for us to be saved. Uh, so singing that message, welcome to Lakeside Christian Church, where we uh, are places where we gather together to love God care for people and to communicate his word and is our custom as a church to celebrate once a month the lord's table that reflects on the sacrifice of christ that he gave his own body and his poured out his blood for our sins and that he rose again and we can look at um at this as we um come forward today i was just reflecting on a verse that goes right along with the song we just sang about um, but First John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we come to the Lord's table and reflect on it, we invite all who believe in Jesus Christ that he is your Savior, that he has forgiven you, that he paid for your sin, that only in him, only in his, the shedding of his blood do you find forgiveness that you can celebrate with us freely and openly to rejoice in his sacrifice. You know, Paul uh, encouraged us to examine ourselves to be sure that we're in the faith. And as we come to the communion table, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on, am I trying to get there on my own? Am I, am I caught up in my own self-righteousness or do I surrender all to Christ and say, yes, Jesus, you paid for me and I want to celebrate that because you lived the perfect life where I failed every day. You poured out your blood for us where I, c I could not pay my own sin debt. And, you know, and Jesus rose again the third day. So we can be here some 2,000 years later and celebrate this um, and rejoice and proclaim his death until he returns. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, I'm going to invite you to come forward through the center aisle and take a, a bread and the cup and go back to your seat. And once everybody is seated, uh, then I'll read a scripture and we'll partake together. If you're unable to walk forward, Darren is going to walk around, and if uh, you just raise your hand, he'll bring the bread and the cup to you um, and your seat. So let's pray, and then we'll celebrate together. Father God, we are so thankful and humbled to be able to come here today uh, to praise your name, uh, to speak of the truths of who you are, to re be reminded from your word that you are God, that you created all things, Lord, and, and you sought set out to show your love to us even though we are sinners and have fallen lord that you sent your son jesus christ in this world lord where we failed to keep the law that you have given us and how we can relate to you jesus kept it perfectly for us lord uh, he was willing to give his life and go to the cross to shed his blood for us lord so that we would have forgiveness of sins and a hope and a promise to be with you starting today and throughout eternity lord as we um, follow Jesus' command to, to take this bread and this cup and to remember his life and his death and the sacrifice that he paid for us until he returns. We, we pray that you'll help us to remember and to reflect on your goodness, both in what you've recorded in the scriptures for us and how you continue that into our lives this very day. So Lord, as we take these elements together, may we celebrate this and be reminded of the communion of the saints that have been celebrating this for 2,000 years and in anticipation of your future return. And so we commit this time to you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Apostle Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful again to have celebrated this together, uh, to reflect and remember your kindness and your goodness that you've demonstrated to us in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that as Jesus Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he sent forth his Holy Spirit to live in us, Lord. And through the power of the Spirit, we can live the resurrected life in victory, declaring your uh, grace and your love and your forgiveness and your resurrection until Jesus returns. And so we pray that as a church that we would be reminded each and every day uh, to walk in fellowship with the Spirit and uh, allow him to empower us and to Im impact the communities that we live in. Lord, we pray this morning as Peter uh, brings forth the word from John that we would have um, our hearts and our minds ready to receive what you would have for us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd also like to welcome you to Lakeside this morning. And it's a joy to start with a birth announcement this Sunday, but we sent out a prayer request on Friday morning to pray for Christina and Michael Seppi as they were anticipating the birth of their daughter at any moment. We didn't put it in there, but they were at the hospital. And by that afternoon, just a very, very early evening, Annabelle Marie Seppi was born to Michael and Christina, and so we're excited for them and their big brothers, Ethan and Isaac. And so we just invite you to continue to pray for them as a family. We anticipate that Michael and Christina and Annabelle will be able to come home today, which is great news. And so, yeah, we invite, we thank you for the prayers you've already prayed and invite you to continue to pray for them as now they are a family of five. And I invite you now to take a Bible to open it to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. We began last week uh, a series that will include the entire Gospel. For us, a, a bit of a slower pace than is typical of working through a book of the Bible, but doing so because it's one of the books, one of four in our Bibles that show us up close and personal the life and the teachings and the interactions and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And we believe that the grand story of Scripture is to point to him. And so part of walking slowly through a gospel account of him is to learn about him and to consider who he is, what he said, and what implications those have for us today. We read the first 18 verses last week, so we'll pick it up in verse 19 of chapter 1 and read to verse 34. John chapter 1, verse 19, and this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they'd been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. 
And John bore witness, and I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he whom baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And that will conclude our reading for today. So the John that's being described here is not John the Gospel writer. Uh, This is the person most commonly referred to as John the Baptist. And we learn some pretty interesting things about him in this passage. But first of all, uh, in his own description of his assignment, was that John was a voice in the wilderness. He was a preacher. He was called to tell people something, to point them in a certain direction. He did it in a unique way in terms of the diet that he had and how he looked, but his message was announcing to people out in the wilderness to be prepared, to make straight. In other words, anything that's out of place, get it back in place. Anything that's crooked, make it straight because the Lord is coming. And so he, the voice, he was using his voice in the wilderness to call people to preparation. A similar type of preparation you or I would do for any big occasion that we have coming up in our lives. You might think of the effort you put into celebrating a birthday of someone you love or selling an an, celebrating an anniversary of a special event. And there's certain occasions in your life that you, you don't simply so recognize and celebrate, but you prepare for them. You, you want to acknowledge them in a unique way, and so you put a lot more thought into them. And John is saying, for the Christ who's going to come, We have to be ready. There's a work of preparation that we have to do if we're going to receive him. We can't assume that we can just be focused on all of our own things and distracted, and then just randomly somehow we're going to be ready for that day. But their preparation needs to go into it. And this is a theme in terms of worship throughout the whole of Scripture. I grew up in a context where even in the preaching of sermons, it was generally thought that it's not necessarily a good thing to prepare what you're going to say ahead of time. Because if you do prepare, it's too much of you and it's not enough of the Holy Spirit just kind of inspiring you in the moment. And so there was that sense that if we already know ahead of time what we're going to sing and what we're going to pray and what's going to be said, where are we leaving room for God? That's a, it's a reasonable thing. We want to be open emotionally to something unique and different happening, needing to deviate from a schedule. But for any Jew in the Old Testament to go to worship involved significant preparation. The preparation of travel, the preparation of bringing a sacrifice. They, they were prescribed what was supposed to take place when they gathered for worship. And in fact, the moments that we regard as most special, things that might only happen once in a lifetime, are the things that we give the most amount of thought to, like a wedding ceremony. And all the work of preparation and details, which can feel burdensome at times, enhances what is experienced in the moment. It doesn't distract from it. It doesn't take away from it when every single detail has been thought out and decided. What are people going to wear? How is it going to look? What's going to be sung? Who's going to do it? We still, yes, in all of those decisions, want to factor in God and be open to his leading but there's a preparation that needs to take place if we're going to be truly ready. And that was part of John's call. If the Lord really does come, are we ready? Are we showing ourselves prepared to meet him? Are we open-minded and open-hearted to things that he might say? And that was the challenge that he gave to people, and he did it so effectively that people were actually wondering if he was the Christ. So where our passage picked up was that people were sent to him from the Jews to ask him the question, who are you? He said, I'm not the Christ. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And he has to say, no, no, no. Actually, in this chapter, most of the things that are said about John are in the negative. In the beginning, in in verse 6, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him, but he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And then we read that he is 
not the Christ. He is not Elijah. He is not the prophet. But if we think about it for a moment, if all these people were mistaking him for those things, how well respected was he? (laughs) If you have to clarify to people that you're not the Christ and you're not the light and you're not Elijah, you have a pretty stellar reputation in the community that people would look at you and mistake you for all of those different people. But John knew that he came to bear witness to the light. John knew his limitations. He knew that he wasn't the savior. He wasn't the one who could bear the sins of the world. Again, that's a theme throughout scripture where God never desires us to try to do more than he's created us to be able to do. More often than not, when we get in trouble as human beings, it's when we reject the limitations that God has placed on us and we try to do the things that only God can do. That's where scripture starts in the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, that they're put in a place of paradise, they're given only really one limitation and the temptation becomes for them, should we accept that limitation or should we try to be like God? What if we knew good and evil like God did and they go outside of that? And then again, throughout scripture, repeated in story after story, when certain people attain power, the temptation for them to think thoughts of themselves that they never should think, that they can do whatever they want and they can treat people any way they want because they have all authority instead of recognizing in humility, no, no, no. Even if you're king, you're still not the light. You're still not the Messiah. You're still not the savior. And when we get that wrong, it often leads to horrible consequences for ourselves and then horrible consequences for other people. But John knew his rightful place and he knew his limitations. He knew that he was not the light. So everyone had to prepare for this king, this coming Messiah, and John himself had to prepare. He himself had to get ready. And he describes it later to say, this person who's coming, I'm not even worthy to bend down and basically help him with his shoes. That's how much greater he is than me. So everyone's looking at him as this amazing person and he's trying to tell them, however good you think I am, I'm not even worthy to bow down and fix his shoes. And that was John's way of also preparing for the coming of this king. We have a a modern day example of this that's been in the news this week because of the passing of Reverend Billy Graham at 99 years old. And many different stories have been told and many articles written about his legacy. But one of the things that distinguishes him is I've read many different accounts from people that agreed with him and didn't agree with him. If you say, what, what was part of the, the difference for him as it relates to other people? That there was a 130 mile processional yesterday that he will lie in state for two days this week at the Capitol building, which is not usually afforded to ordinary citizens. Other people were evangelists. Other people told the good news of who Jesus was. Other people tried to do that in new and creative ways through TV or all kinds of media. So one of the unique and distinguishing features was not necessarily those aspects of what he did, but they maintained a consistency over a lifetime. You and I, most of us, won't be tempted in our lifetime to have stadiums of hundreds of thousands of people listening to us to then be tempted to think we're more important than we are. But when whole cities have to prepare for your coming and massive crowds listen, the temptation is always to start to think more of ourselves than we should and to no longer recognize the limitations that we should place upon ourselves because we're still human and we're still frail. But one of the distinguishing characteristics for him was embracing those limitations. 
not either allowing the crowds to then go to his head and think that he was somehow the savior or not allowing himself to think, I've got this all under control. I don't have to make any preparations to protect my marriage. No, he made protection and provision to make sure that his marriage was protected while he was mostly traveling and away from his spouse. To make sure that, because anytime those things happened, a lot of money is involved in it. That there, there wasn't any scandal of how that money was used and what it was used for. And that's where so many other people who started in the same way eventually fell off. Either because it all got to their head or because someone was mismanaging the money or because it all of a sudden only became about the money or they weren't protecting their marriage and their relationship and they allowed their morals to be compromised. And therefore, we don't know who they are anymore. And part of the uniqueness in what is being celebrated and recognized in the life of that humble servant is the consistency over a period of time to never forget who he was and who Jesus was. I mean, so much so that he almost got made fun of it for being just from a, you know, a farm boy who couldn't necessarily speak to the intelligent crowds. But for him, it was a, I never forget where I came from. And yes, I will try to always share the message in the simplest terms possible so that the most amount of people can understand what's being said. Because it's not about him as a speaker trying to show off his knowledge, but as a witness to the light, pointing other people so that they would really truly consider who Jesus was. And so the quote, if you have a handout as you came in today, on the back of it is from him. To say in simple terms, Christ not only died for all, he died for each. And to proclaim the message of Christ to as many people as would hear it. That he is the light. He's the one that people need to consider. This was John the Baptist's temptation. He was so popular in his day that people said so many nice things about him that he could have easily taken that and misused it or abused it. And all along the way, he didn't. At the first opportunity that Jesus then enters onto the scene, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, like stop, look, look over here. Quit being distracted. Focus yourself on this person. And when John the Baptist was given the opportunity to focus people's attention, he focused it on Jesus. And he said that this Jesus is the Lamb of God, which most of the people listening to it that day didn't know how the story would continue and definitely how the story would end. Couldn't have had too, many, too much knowledge or expectation of what that would mean. But just in this very short section of scripture that we read, we are being prepared as readers of this account to consider that Jesus is very different than any other person who's ever lived. When John said that he came to bear witness, uh, that he came to be the voice in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord, in the prophecy of Isaiah, the Lord there is Yahweh. <laughs> Prepare for the Lord, all capital letters then to announce him as the Lamb of God upon whom the Spirit has descended, and then in verse 34, the Son of God. Those are all pretty profound claims about who Jesus is, that he is the Lord come to us, the Lamb of God, the one who baptizes with the Spirit, and the one who is God's unique and only Son. He is the light. It takes the rest of the gospel for us to understand what each of those things mean. That the challenge of John the Baptist to us is are we open to considering it? <laughs> Will we make the right preparation with open minds and hearts to consider him, to actually focus and to look at who he is and what he said that he could do for you and for me? 
when he says that he baptizes with the Spirit, part of what John is indicating is that what John was doing in baptizing people in water, it was real and it was meaningful, it was significant. But it's only Jesus who can do what all of that symbolizes. He's the only one that can really clean us from the inside out. He's the only one who can actually wash away the sin. So much of what we do is meant to uh, symbolize it and point to it. But Jesus is the substance of it. And so in saying, behold the Lamb of God, he, he indicates one of the things that that means. He says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we experience that sin on a regular basis. And if we ask the question, is, can anyone take it away? <laughs> can anyone wash us clean? Can anyone remove the stain or the previous hurts that have taken place? John is saying, yes, it's him. It's not me. He knows who he is, and he knows who Jesus is. And the challenge for us is if we'll consider that, if we'll embrace our own limitations as God-given. In this past week, it was brought home to me. Uh, I've, our family enjoys whatever we can capture of the Olympics and just appreciating there again an example physically of years of preparation trying to accomplish a goal. But I asked, I, I was trying to explain uh, to Levi how this doesn't happen like every year. This actually happens every four years. And so I said to him, the next time there's going to be a Winter Olympics, you're going to be nine. Just kind of looking at me. And then I, as I said that out loud, I was like, oh, wait a minute like three winter Olympics till you're like in college. That sounds crazy. I still feel like brand new at this. But no, if you're going to be nine at the next one and three is 12, just a few days before, as he was enjoying it, I said, do you want to be an Olympic athlete one day? He said, yeah. I said, really, in what? Snowboarding. I said, yeah. I said, why? He said, but, but, but he says, but by the time I'm in the Olympics, you'll probably be dead. <laughs> so I said, well, if I am, I'm going to watch you from heaven. But we are, we're human. We don't know how much time we have. We know time flies, however much time we have. We're shocked when it's gone from us. How silly to make more of ourselves than we ever really should. And to add the stress on our lives and the anxiety that comes when we don't embrace our limitations, but instead try to do things that God has never asked us to try to do or be things that other people expect of us but just aren't honest and real. And if you think about some of the most stressful moments in your life, in mine, it's usually when we try to do much more than we can or capable of. John is saying, don't, don't do more than you can. And when you think about what can take away the wrongs of what you've done, there again, don't fall into the trap of trying to do it on your own. Look to Jesus. He's the lamb. He's the light. He's the one who can do what you and I can't do. And if we commit to that message consistently over the course of a lifetime, not only will we be healthier, but even the people around us, the relationships that we have with other people, that they'll be able to testify that we were free to love them and give to them and care about them because we weren't trying to get everyone to look at us and focus on us, but we were willing to shine the light on him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have come into the world, that there is a message that we have to proclaim, that the problems that we can't solve on our own, of the limitations of our mind and our bodies, the stain that exists in our life because of our sin and our stupid choices, that you have come. 
we confess in our pride, we, we still want to try to figure things out on our own and we want to try to be our own saviors. And we pray that you would help us not to do that. Help us at John's invitation and the invitation of many in our own lives who have tried to point us to Christ, to keep our eyes on him, to keep our focus on the only one who could die and rise again and give all of us and each of us the hope that we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song. dismissed in the good news that you are not the Christ but he is this will conclude our service this morning